always wise and understanding mind. Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbour bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, uninspiring, demotic, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. On to chapter 4. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the word means enmity against God? Therefore, everyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says, without reason, that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? What he gives us, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favour to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. This is the word of the Lord. church prayer meeting. Woman stood up and said, Brothers and sisters, please pray for me. This has been a very trying week. The old devil's been trying to do everything he can in his power to make me miserable. Pray that I'll survive. She sits down. A husband stands up and said, Brothers and sisters, I want you to know she's not the easiest person in the world to get along with either. Lots of people live with somebody who isn't easy to get along with. And sometimes it's us who aren't easy to get along with. And some days, perhaps, things are worse than others. People say today, well, if we're going to get over this problem of fighting and feuding, we need to get back to the church and the Christianity of the first century. If we start living for Jesus the way the original Christians did, then we wouldn't be having all these arguments. But when you read the Bible, you find out that those guys fought with each other just as much as we do. In Mark 9, at the pinnacle of Jesus' ministry, at the very time he needed the apostles to be unified more than anything else, we discover in verse 34, they were having a quarrel as they went along the road that Jesus unpacked with them. Which one of them was the greatest? James chapter 4, we find that even after the resurrection of Jesus, people are still fighting. Now we're going to look at it through the eyes of James today. In this passage, we find out how to conquer uh, conflict and uh, what the causes of it are, the who, the why and the how. Who caused it? Why are we having it? How do we resolve it? Jesus tells us that there are three areas of conflict in our lives and the first is conflict with others. Now in our house groups in London we had one series where we played games to illustrate Bible principles. One was a psychological exercise called the aggressive pacifier evader game. We all took cards and had to assume one of those basic roles as we were given various conflict situations, including imagine we, imagining we are uh, on a PCC debate. The aggressors, of course, always won, as you can imagine. The evaders just wanted to go off and make tea, they were so upset. And the pacifiers just wanted to agree and please everybody. Then we analysed how we felt about it, having assumed those roles. Most people were very unhappy about playing the aggressor. 
Christians were simply not supposed to behave like that. Then I gave out a set of cards where everybody was a pacifier. At first it was wonderful. It sounded great. Uh, within a few minutes everybody was falling out laugh, full about laughing because most were on the PCC in the group and it was just like a PCC meeting. Uh, the PCCs were wonderful, but they went on and on and on, and nobody could ever make any decisions because everybody was trying to make everybody else happy. And you might say they were godly, but someone would come up with an idea. Why not have a mission in this area? Yeah, let's do that. And then somebody would suggest something else and somebody else and something else. And in fact, they'd agree to anything, but in fact, they agreed to nothing in the end. It was here, there and everywhere. Conflict happens partly because we're different characters, and that's fine. We need to recognise it. My heading, you notice, was how to avoid arguments. Actually, I want to say arguments sometimes, I mean, honest, loving debate about subjects are OK. Without them, most organisations would never function effectively at all. It's all the other things that go into it that cause the problems. And when they're blown up from the world scale, it's not just called conflict or argument, it's called war. A study a few years ago by the Canadian Army Journal record, uh, regarding the frequency of human conflict came up with a very interesting statistic. Since 3600 BC, the world has known only 292 years of peace. During this period, there have been 14,531 wars, large and small, in which 3,640 3, million people have been killed. The results then of conflict and argument can be disastrous, but they usually start with actually conflict within ourselves. Galatians 5 says the sinful nature is what the sinful nature desires is conflict contrary to what the spirit desires, and the spirit is contrary to the sinful nature. There's a civil war going in inside us very often, isn't there? But also there's conflict with God. We have conflict with others because we have conflict going on because of what's going on inside us, a conflict in our personal lives. James says, because we have a conflict with God. You'll see this as we progress through the passage. What are the causes of conflict? James 4, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come uh, from your desires that battle within you? James here doesn't beat about the bush, he gets right to the point. James says, the cause of conflict is conflicting desires. When my wants conflict with your wants, sparks are going to fly. Now, the Greek word for desires is hedone. It's where we get our English word hedonism. And whenever it turns up in the New Testament, it's always in a negative context. Titus says, at one time we too were enslaved by all kinds of passions and desires. Conflict actually starts early in life, even before we can talk. Have you noticed that a baby, if its needs are not instantly gratified, he lets you know very loudly. You can argue even if you don't know how to talk. Marriage has built-in conditions for conflict. Think about the things you expected of your spouse before you got married. How idealistic and unrealistic you were about it. What a rude awakening it was. Uh, the day you woke up, they say all marriages go through three stages. Stage one, happy honeymoon. Stage two, the party's over. Stage three, let's make a deal. At stage three, you learn to handle conflict. Why? Because it's going to happen. Uh, there are all, always going to be conflicting desires and frustrated feelings causes fights. What desires? Well, the Bible makes it very clear here and in other places that there are three basic desires that we have that cause conflict and arguments. These desires are illegitimate unless they get out of control. They're God-given. But when you put them above other people, when they become number one in your life, they'll cause conflict. What are they? Well, they're firstly, the desire to have things. We want to have stuff, materialism, possessions. Another translation of verse 2 says, You want what you don't have. You long for what others have. Now, God created things for us to use and to enjoy. That's what they're there for. We use things and we love people. The problem starts when we start loving things and using people. When we do that, we start manipulating them, controlling them, moving around to get what we want, because things are more important in our lives. Someone asked Howard Hughes, how much uh, will it take to make a man happy? And he said, just a little more. 
the thrill of having stuff wears off very quickly. You have to learn to deal with the desire that you have. If you decide to base your life on comparing it with others, you'll never be happy no matter how much you have. Just, uh, you know, talk about keeping up with the Joneses. Every time you uh, keep up with them, they refinance. There's always something more. But secondly is we do it because we want, the, there's the desire to feel good. We all want to feel good. I want to be comfortable. I want my senses satisfied. But verse three says, you want only what will give you pleasure. It's not wrong to enjoy life. Timothy says, God made everything for our enjoyment. But when pleasure becomes the number one goal in your life, if it feels good, do it. You're asking for conflict. It's going to cause problems because when my pleasure takes the place of what's needful, then we're in trouble. The fact is, I'm more interested in my comfort than I am in yours. Uh, all I think about is what makes me feel good. The desire to feel good is what causes conflict in this case. We so have got the idea that I, uh, the more I have, the better I will feel. But the feeling only lasts for a little while. Then thirdly, there's the desire to be number one. You know, me first. We're living in a world where people are all wrapped up in themselves. I want to have recognition, pats on the back. Proverbs 13 says, pride leads to arguments. Only by pride comes contention. Why? I'm too proud to compromise. And that's what causes conflict. Have you ever been in an argument where you know that you were wrong, but you wouldn't admit it? Why? Because of pride. Pride causes arguments. It's the bottom line in all things. So next time you get in an argument, you stop and say, A, am I right? And B, is it worth it? Four, unfulfilled desires cause conflict. Why do my desires go unfulfilled? Well, James says in uh, 2 and 3, you do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you're asking from the wrong motives. Here, James gives us two reasons why our desires aren't fulfilled. One is that we don't pray. We don't ask God, so we can't answer a prayer that's not been prayed. Why don't we ask? Because we are self-sufficient. We look to the wrong source ourselves. It says, I'll meet your needs, just pray. And when we do pray, sometimes we pray with the wrong motive. We ask for selfish things. The Bible says, I'll give you everything you need, not everything you want. Philippians, my God will supply all your needs according to his glory in Christ Jesus, if we ask in prayer. Why don't I pray? I don't think I need God at that moment. If I really thought about, uh, I was really more dependent on God and I needed him more, I'd pray more. But B, we pray with the wrong motives. James 4 says, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motive. But what you spend, you get, uh, you will get on, or you spend what you get on your pleasures. So James is simply saying, check your motives. God is concerned with legitimate needs and desires. He's promised to meet those needs. But if we ask God for something for the wrong reason or from a wrong motive, then God simply won't answer the prayer. In the next verse, James talks about conflict with God. Pride not only confl causes conflict with people, but also with God. Verse 6, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God declares war on selfishness. Have you noticed that God has a unique way of engineering circumstance just to pop out pride? Just about the time we think we've got it together. He puts us in our place if we think that we don't need him. And to be in opposition to God is a dangerous place to be. We're on a collision course and we're not going to win. Because thirdly, we have ruptured our relationship with God. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God, James says. It's important here to know what um, the word world means. It's in John's Gospel. The word world is cosmos, simple human nature, with its complex web of motives, desires and perceptions that are focused entirely on life in this present universe. James isn't saying you can't have non-Christian friends or do unreligious things, but he is saying God must come first. Now, we all know what adultery is. That's when you're married to one person and having an affair with somebody else. It's being unfaithful to your spouse. Now, the church of Jesus Christ is married to him. And when we're having an affair with the world, we're being unfaithful to our heavenly spouse. 
we're telling we're not pleased with him or satisfied with him. James said, we have committed spiritual adultery and follow this inner lower desires. We've forgotten that we live here, but our expectation of life to come should give us a new perspective. And so we need God's forgiveness. We've covered the area causes of conflict. Now let's look at the cure. In verse five, it says, God is a jealous God and he will not share us with the world. You cannot say serve God and this world. You either totally serve God or you totally serve the world. There's no other in, no in between. You're either God's or you're not. What's the cure? Firstly, it's God's grace. The good news begins in verse six. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. When we proudly fight and lobby for what we want at the expense of others, God opposes us. But when we humble ourselves and say, not my will, but thy will be done, then God gives us the grace and the love and the support that we need. We all need God's grace to end conflicts, to end conflicts with others, within ourselves and with God. So we have to, secondly, give in to God. James 4 says, submit yourselves to God in verse 7. And the Greek word to submit means to place yourself under authority. How do we do that? Well, let me give you an example. When I was at uh, Theological College many, many years ago, we had students from all over the world, all shapes and sizes. One was uh, a white Kenyan. As far as I know, we had no Scottish blood at all, but he always wore a kilt. And there was just something about him that really annoyed me. If I was going to something where I know he'd be there, I'd steal myself up and I, I could keep it up, keep be nice to him for about three minutes. And uh, then I found myself boiling. It went on for months. One day I got to the end of my tether and I sat in the room and prayed, Lord, I can't do this anymore. You'll have to do it. Suddenly it lifted. It was as if a fog had vanished. God gives grace to the humble, so submit yourselves. But that's only step one. Let me just expand that little bit as I end. To some Christians, righteous living is a matter of self-discipline and cold baths. You know what I mean? To others at the other end of the spectrum, it's let go and let God. Now, which is right? Actually, you need both. You need grace and the Holy Spirit that come from God. But you need faith in order for it to be received. Let me illustrate this. How, how do you make a concrete path? If you just pour concrete onto the ground, it flows away, often blocks up the drain and you cause more damage. So what do you do to make a path? You get four wooden planks. You nail them together, you put them on the ground, then you pour in the concrete. When it's set, you can take the boards away. Now grace and the Holy Spirit are just like that. If they're poured into us, they just flow out. The boards are actually what we do. Let's take my Kenyan friend. Uh, I couldn't love him till I submitted to God. But then I had to decide what to do in order for the Holy Spirit to work. Maybe I'd uh, submit it to God in prayer, one board. Uh, then I'd invite him to tea, second board. Then I'd uh, get some nice cake uh, of his favourite cake, the one, three boards. And then I said, I decide beforehand what, what we'd have a chat about, things that would interest him, fourth board. I never couldn't change anything myself. It was just faith. Then God could pour in the concrete and much of the situation with Petra, I can't say ever found him easy, but um, uh, God enables us to love each other. We're saved by faith through grace, but we also live our daily lives by faith through grace. We have to do the outward actions and let God change us inside. It's all a cooperation with God. That's why it says, faith without works is dead.